Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We will uh, kick off the Tuesday, July 12th LEPC meeting uh, with the announcement that this meeting of the LEPC is being recorded by Missoula County Access Television as part of a media access grant donated to Missoula County. This meeting will be aired on MCAT channel 189 or 190 and downloaded to MCAT's video on demand at a later date. Uh, please speak into the microphone when you're using it or when you're speaking. Uh, we'll make that available to you uh, just so that we ensure the audio capture. So uh, with that said, we'll, we'll start with uh, introductions and we'll pass that microphone around uh, and then we'll recognize the folks online. Uh, hopefully Nick can help us get that done. Uh, I'll start with, uh, my name is Paul Finley. I am the chairman for LEPC and a member of Missoula Rural Fire District. Brad Davis, Vice Chair, Missoula Fire Department. Nick Holloway, Missoula County Office of Emergency Management. Ken Parks, Missoula County Office of Emergency Management. Kirsten Brinkley, Western Region Healthcare Coalition Coordinator. Sarah Cofield, Missoula City County Health Department. Garrett Hufid, Missoula City County Health Department. Max Rappoltz, Missoula County Emergency Management. And Randy Ocon, Missoula County Office of Emergency Management. Eddie McLean, Missoula Police Department. Samantha Lisai, I'm a fellow from NMCDC. Jason Lindsay, Western Montana Chaplains Association. Chuck Keller, Western Montana Chaplains Association and MRFD. Diane Johnson, Montana Chaplain Experience. Hi, I'm Jamie Campbell. I'm with Montana Legal Services Association. Dave Stromeyer, Missoula County Commissioner, apparently on the wrong side of the room. Thanks, Commissioner. And we also have Marty Whitmore online. Here's the online folks. Corey Hafner, Ray Nicholas, Jen Rabome, Jeff Roderick, Brian Hensel, Gail Carlson, Dean Christensen, Chuck Emnett, Angela Yance, Brian Hensel, I already said Brian, uh, David Korea, um, Eric, Eric Legvold, TJ Hagamo, Aaron Helm, Janessa Babcock, Jennifer Sweaton, uh, Jeanette Smith, Judy Douglas, Malin Manson, and Megan Shelton. Is there anybody I missed online? Hey, Nick, it's Tim with Surfer. Thanks, Tim. Anybody else? Hey, Nick, it's Tommy with Child Care Resources. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you. I'm Sandra Pasika, um, City Council, Ward 6. And I also see Jeff. Let's go ahead, Jeff. Oh, Jeff Tom Jock from Nexion. Thanks. I think that covers everybody under the See More button. So. <laughs> technology. Uh, we'll move on. Thank you everybody for your introductions. Uh, we'll move on to public comment if there's any uh, in the room or online. All right. Seeing no public comment, we will move on to uh, approval of minutes from the last meeting. And a copy is uh, available at the back of the room if necessary. Motion to approve. Second. And a second. Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor of approval, signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? All right. Um, we'll move on to uh, community preparedness presentation. Uh, smoke readiness with uh, Sarah Cofield, please. Okay. Give me just a second to get this up. Let's see here. Just 
All right, well, um, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Sarah Cofield. I'm an air quality specialist with Missoula City County Health Department. Those who know me know that I obsess over wildfire smoke and how we can approach it. This is our Wildfire Smoke Ready Week. It's the second one uh, ever in Missoula County and also the state. The state does not have their own, so we just do it ourselves. Um, and uh, Nick asked me to come and talk a little bit about Wildfire Smoke Ready Week, but more about, um, I think incident, uh, what happens while there's smoke in the air and where folks can get information. Um, so we'll focus more on that than all the cool things you can do to clean your air. For that information, we have a great website and also you could be reading my columns in the Missoulian all week or getting my emails. So go ahead and move forward. So first off, I wanna talk about why we care about wildfire smoke. Um, wildfire smoke is quite literally a chemical stew. There are hundreds of chemicals that form during the incom incomplete combustion of a wildfire in the woods. But the uh, chemicals include things like formaldehyde, benzene, and acrolein that give you, uh, you know, stinging eyes and scratchy throat and headaches. Um, but the pollutant we're most concerned about is actually the fine particulate matter in smoke. These are really, really, really tiny particles. We call them PM 2.5 for particles two and a half microns in diameter and smaller, but they're actually that and smaller fraction. These are far less than even one micron in diameter. And that means they can burrow really deep into your lungs and bypass all of your natural defenses. Your system has a lot of ways to keep you healthy when, from all the just random crud that's in the air. Um, but the fine particles can bypass those defensive systems in your body and uh, get deep into your lungs and even pass into your bloodstream. So you can go to the next slide. Um, now, this is just kind of the same, same as that. I, so I'm not in control of my slides. I kind of forget where I am. Um, they are just very, very tiny. This is a really classic image of fine particulate matter that you see um, where it's comparing it to a human hair or a grain of sand. This stuff's just super tiny. and goes really deep into your system. I can, next slide. Uh, so things people experience when they're exposed to wildfire smokes and the first things that they notice is really from those chemicals in the smoke. Um, that just make you feel really kind of scummy and, and uncomfortable, but they aren't the really serious health impacts. Those are what we see from the um, particulate matter where we start to see things like reduced lung function, aggravation of COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. These are things like your chronic uh, bronchitis and your emphysema. You have increased frequency and severity of asthma attacks. Uh, you have uh, people with pneumonia complications. You have people visiting the emergency room for respiratory issues more often. Uh, you have increased susceptibility to infectious disease because it impacts your immune system function, which is not great in a pandemic, or really ever. Um, you also have increased risk of stroke and heart attack, and you do see increased mortality uh, during and immediately following a smoke event. So this is really nasty stuff. You can keep going. Um, folks who are most susceptible to wildfire smoke are people who, uh, it's not a terribly surprising list, um, but children, children are really a high risk group from wildfire smoke exposure. Uh, their lungs are still developing and don't actually really finish developing until they're adults. So you have this uh, system that is not fully formed and you're exposing it to these chemicals, these irritants and this inflammation. Um, and uh, this is one of the age groups where studies have shown uh, one of the more dramatic increases in um, emergency room visits for asthma compared to other age groups uh, during a smoke event. Um, and there's also been uh, a study that looked at uh, monkeys that were exposed to a smoke event in California in 2007 where they were infants and were out for the entire smoke event. And then they followed those monkeys uh, for like the next 10 years or so. Um, this was on purpose, they just happened to be outside. Uh, and they found uh, really life lasting impacts on those primates, you know, stiffening lungs and immune system issues. Uh, and reduce lung function like going into their, their lives. So uh, we definitely want to keep kids out of smoke if at all possible. Um, people with chronic health problems such as uh, heart and lung disease, and I mean like any heart disease, if you have elevated blood pressure, you're at increased risk from wildfire smoke exposure. Uh, the elderly, you know, folks who have been exposed to uh, enough in their lifetimes and their systems are maybe starting to 
uh, decline a little bit or have already been through a lot of stressors, you don't want to add smoke on top of that. That's like the other age category, in addition to young children, you see more um, hospital visits during a smoke event. Uh, and pregnant people, we're, we're starting to see some research coming out looking at impacts on um, things like birth weights. Uh, so overall, this is about 30% of the population. It's, it's a lot of people um, that are impacted more by smoke than everyone else. And this isn't even talking about people who have no option but to work outdoors in smoke, or people who have uh, homes that don't have anybody to clean their, their air, or people who are unhoused. Um, so there's actually people who are exposed to even more smoke than the general population uh, that aren't even on this list. So it's a lot of people that are being uh, really stuck in this case of having a really bad pollutant in their lives uh, that would be nice if they weren't stuck breathing it. Um, so I keep going. So public health role during, during a smoke event, uh, in my mind, is really three-pronged. Uh, there's a big communication lift. There are interventions you can do. And there's a lot of work to be done advocating for policy. Um, so just to kind of make this uh, simple, because I usually give this talk to more generic groups in just Missoula County. So the stars are things that we do here locally. Uh, I do a lot of communication, issuing advice for creating clean air spaces, issuing health advisories and guidance documents, providing smoke outlooks advice reducing exposure, and I respond to a lot of questions from the public. Um, other communities have created cleaner air shelters. This, this is a really big lift that I cannot do. Um, it's very expensive, and I would rather just give people air cleaners um, than uh, try to set up a shelter for an unknown amount of time, for an unknown amount of people, um, and spend all that money and time and resources uh, when you just give people a way to clean the air at home and have it be less stressful for everybody. Um, but it's something other communities have looked at. Uh, we have a cache of air cleaners that we've loaned out to daycares and preschools. Um, and then I might be hitting up Adrienne about her stash of N95s uh, when we get closer to the smoke event. Um, the only policy thing that we've really been able to do or that we do here locally is really advocating for people to adopt uh, the indoor air quality Guidelines put out by ASHRAE, which is the American Association of Heating, Refrigerating, Engineering, uh, Air Conditioning Engineers. This is the group that sets the standards for HVAC operation in buildings such as this courthouse and every commercial building. Um, and they have finally have come up with what folks can do about wildfire smoke. Um, this is new uh, as of February 2021. Before that, there is no formal issuance by any big authorized type agency saying, hey, here's what you can do about smoke in commercial spaces. Um, it's not a requirement, uh, but it would be really nice if uh, commercial spaces were to adopt this guidance put out by ASHRAE uh, so we can have cleaner indoor air uh, in our, all of our workplaces and our schools, um, because there is no requirement that your indoor air be clean. And uh, one thing we have learned by doing some studies is the indoor air in commercial buildings can get smoky pretty fast, and it is more complicated to keep clean than a home. Um, other uh, communities that do things like cancel or postpone events, they close schools, and they some states, uh, Washington, Oregon, and California, actually have rules in place to protect outdoor workers from wildfire smoke. We don't have anything like that in Montana. Um, at the health department, we issue guidance and recommendations about activities, but we don't close schools or cancel events um, from the health department because of smoke. So I can keep going. So what do you do when smoke rolls into town? Um, go to the next slide. Uh, you want to check the air quality. Happily, this is pretty easy to do. Uh, we have air quality monitors uh, scattered around the state. We actually have three in Missoula County. These are in Frenchtown, Missoula, and Sealy Lake. And they give you hourly data uh, of the current air quality condition. Uh, and that's just at the Montana Today's Air website. Um, we get this handy little chart that shows you um, really the last 24 hours or so of air quality conditions using the health categories that uh, EPA established. Uh, you can also just look outside. Uh, if you can't see for five miles, the air quality is unhealthy. If you can't see for three miles, it's very unhealthy. And if you can't see for two miles, that is hazardous air quality. Um, I might, uh, might be five, two, one. Anyway, look outside. If you look smoky, it's probably smoky. Um, but it's a handy way to just kind of gauge air quality we aren't near a monitor. Go to the next slide. You can also go to EPA's fire and smoke map, which is fire.airnow.gov. Uh, this is a really cool map. They'll show you where all the fires are. They'll show you the permanent air monitors. They'll show you temporary air monitors that are put up by air resource advisors and the state. 
uh, to get looks at air quality in regions that don't have a permanent air monitor, and they pull in data from the purple air sensors. And these are low-cost sensors that cost, um, well, we call them low-cost because a permanent monitor costs like tens of thousands of dollars, so it's anything less than a thousand dollars seems kind of low-cost in government. Um, so a purple air sensor will cost about two, 200 bucks or so, and um, they aren't as accurate as a permanent monitor, but they'll tell you if air quality is changing, and EPA has developed a really great calculation to get it closer to accurate. Uh, so they'll they actually bring in all the data from these lower cost purple air sensors that anybody can put up. And so because of these purple air sensors, I now have uh, the ability to look at air quality in places like the Potomac Valley. There are now a couple up near the Potomac area, and we have some kind of scattered all around Missoula, you can see there. I'm planning on putting up one up in Condon uh, in the next week or so, because I don't have any eyes in Condon right now. Um, so a really great tool, and um, having a way to have like a one-stop shop for all of the air quality monitors in any given region, uh, it's just really neat. You can also kind of see what's coming. So if we have like this big smoke plume headed toward us, you can look at what is happening on this map underneath that plume, I get an idea of what's headed our way. So when I've been seeing occasionally like really big plugs of smoke coming at us from Oregon or California, I can kind of track its impacts on the ground level on its way here and get a feel for what might be hitting us. Um, so that's kind of nifty. Move forward. Uh, and I put out uh, daily smoke forecasts. So while it's smoky, you can actually get a handle on what we're expecting to see by going to our website, missoulacounty.us slash current air quality or get on my email list and just get my updates in the comfort of your inbox. Uh, just shoot me an email at scofield at missoulacounty.us, and I will put you on my list. Um, go to the next slide. So these updates include information about the current air quality conditions associated with health concerns, where the smoke's coming from, where it's going to, what's happening on the fires, how we expect the fire to behave during the day. Is it going to get better? Is it going to get worse? Is there somewhere nearby you could go and get clean air? Like, Sometimes we have smokes just like it's really trapped in a valley. I'm like, oh, you know, 15 miles away is better air. So, you know, go for a road trip. Um, so if I can see like really clean air really nearby, I'll try to let people know, you know, if you can get away, do it. Um, I also provide information on how to stay protected from the smoke um, and lots of maps and photos. So give people a really good idea of what to expect throughout the day um, from the smoke. Because I, I, can't, I can't make it go away. I always, everybody's always like, Sarah, you need a fan. Blow the smoke out of the valley. I'm like, that would be awesome. I would love that, but it doesn't exist. So I can't fix it. Uh, but what I can do is give you some information to help you get through the day, make some plans, uh, and, and really arrange um, your schedule and have some autonomy over your life while we have this smoke um, in the air. Next slide. Uh, so then you know what's happening, you know uh, smoke's coming your way, if it's here, you want to limit your outdoor activities. Um, you know, the, this is a dose and exposure type type of situation. So if it's smoky outside and you're running and you're being really athletic, you're taking in a lot more smoke because you're breathing more deeply and more often. So you can actually reduce your exposure just by slowing your roll. You know, if you have to be outside, fine, but maybe walk and don't run. Um, and and uh, if you can be inside in a place with cleaner air to exercise, then do it in a place with cleaner air. Um, that is not a guarantee, unfortunately. You have to do some digging to make sure wherever you're trying to exercise is taking steps to follow ASRAE's guidance to make sure your indoor air is cleaner wherever you're exercising. I personally exercise in front of my air conditioner on my air cleaners in my home because I know that air is clean because I monitor it because I am a nerd. Um, so anyway, you want to kind of take some steps to reduce your exposure when you're outside. Um, and you go to the next slide. Uh, DEQ has put out this nifty chart. This one is geared specifically for schools and childcare facilities. There's also one that they've put out for the general public. I can see on this emphasis on uh, if you are going to be active, try to do it in a place with good air quality. So you can go to the next thing. And there's, so you see it circling the um, emphasizing good air quality for being active. Um, next slide. And then lastly, um, prepare for smoke coming indoors because it will. Smoke's going to come inside. If we have a really short smoke event, like a day, not a ton of smoke will come inside a home if you close the doors and windows. Um, in a commercial system, it's going to come inside faster because commercial HVAC systems, their job is to take outside air and bring it inside. That's what they do. Um, and some of them do a good job filtering that air. A lot of them don't. 
Uh, and so smoke is going to come inside, and there are steps you can take to um, deal with that uh, on both the home scale and the commercial scale. Go to the next slide. And all this information is at montanawildfiresmoke.org, which is a super nifty website that's hosted by Climus Mont Missoula. Um, and so if you want more information about how to clean the air inside your home or your business, uh, it is here. Um, we have great tips for using air cleaners, for using a home HVAC system, uh, and for making your own air cleaner with a box fan and a furnace filter. And we also have a link out to the guidance from ASHRAE about what commercial spaces can do to protect their um, employees and their customers and everybody who's using that space to make sure that they all have clean air to breathe as well. Um, so here's the next thing. So it's the headlines up there, you know, how to find the air quality, know the health risks, how to create clean air. Um, and there's also links to some of the really long writing that I've done on this topic um, it is in this website as well. Um, and then next slide. Then when it's nice, get outside. Anytime there's a break in the smoke, go outside. Open your doors and windows, air out your home, take advantage of the clean air breaks. We very rarely have like unending smoke. Usually you would get some breaks. So when you do get breaks, take advantage of them. And uh, when the smoke's gone, get back out in the hills. That's what I got. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good information as always. We'll move on to uh, National Weather Service with the update and outlook. Montana and eastern Montana is even worse shape uh, in severe and even some extreme drought. Um, you know, as, as late as the beginning of November, and then as we've gone over the winter, uh, we've just continued to make improvements in that. You know, gotten decent snowpacks and precipitation, and uh, and then this latest round of precipitation here starting in June and then continuing into July here with some thunderstorm stuff that's hit some, just dumped some really nice precip. And then also our, our cool spring with that late, you know, um, snow melt runoff has really helped the stream flow situation to where if you look at a map of USGS stream gauges across all of Western Montana, the stream flows are all above normal. So for this time of year to have the flows that we're seeing in the rivers is just great. Um, I was just on the conversation with the Montana Drought Group this morning and uh, the National Drought Author and pretty much wiping out the, the drought uh, across here in West Montana. The green and beautiful and looking good. And now Marty's going to change that. <laughs> Well, I'm going to try to try to share a screen here. Uh, this meeting's acting a little funky in my end, so I'm not too optimistic. So, um, let me know if you guys are seeing a satellite loop. We're seeing it. All right, great. Um, so, this this is pretty cool because this this is one of my favorite satellite loops. It's a mid-level water vapor. It's really what we're looking for to find the ridges and and low pressure circulations. And uh, this is because of this moisture plume to our north, it's about as well defined <laughs> ridge feature as I've seen, at least on a satellite, pretty clear to pick that out. So that's what's uh, going to be the story for the week, and that's going to be heat. Um, you know, we're, we're warming up pretty good today. I haven't seen what the latest temperature was, but you know, 90 degree temperatures under this ridge are going to be pretty common. I think even some 95s uh, are things we'll see, particularly maybe Saturday looks like probably the warmest day, but every every day looks uh, well above normal. Our normal for this time of year is about 85 for a high. So, you know, we're gonna be on the order of 10 degrees above normal uh, through this, this ridge. It is kind of interesting though, you see this moisture that's moving up from the Great Basin up into our area. It, it certainly could 
provide a little bit of thunderstorm activity. Now this would be different than what we saw uh, late last week, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That was about as active a convective period as as I've seen uh, since living in Missoula. Uh, we issued, uh, I think, 43 severe thunderstorm warnings across our forecast area and a handful of flood advisories. They were almost all hail producers rather than wind producers. Um, and some big, you know, we had as, as large as estimated tennis ball size hail with extensive damage. A lot of times our severe thunderstorms from hail are just the, the one inch, that's kind of our, our, our lowest diameter of hail that constitutes severe. And sometimes you don't get damage with that one inch, but uh, you certainly do with tennis ball size hail. So we had quite a bit of that. We had a, a, a few a few blowouts of some drainages, uh, you know, minor, maybe minor stuff, but just uh, east of here, out right around Bearmouth, uh, I think it did have some debris over the frontage road there. Um, we're looking at something up uh, Montour Creek, up in there that, that muddied up the, the rivers that you guys probably noticed. So, did have some interesting weather. This stuff, though, I don't think the low-level moisture will be quite as prevalent. The dew points we had, like Midwest type dew points last week. Uh, this week uh, could be a mix of, of some hail, but I'm, I'm a little bit worried about these could be wind producers as well, so we'll have to start watching for that. This time of year with thunderstorms, of course, we really worry about outdoor events and trying to give them a heads up. Uh, so any of those that we can get on our on our well, virtual and literal radar screen uh, is beneficial. You know, on Thursday night, they had a concert out at Kettle House. I think we talked to them. 10 or 11 times, uh, trying to give them heads up, and I think they did uh, delay the concert a couple different times. Uh, we're doing the same thing for the Butte Folk Festival, Friday through Saturday as well, so uh, not as much going on. Not as much going on during the week, but, but we'll be doing that periodically. Anyway, the heat looks like it's gonna continue in the next week, maybe temper off a little bit later on. If you look at uh, the six to 10 day, an eight to 14 day forecast. They really pushed the strong hot signature a bit to our east, so the Midwest, particularly the upper, upper plains there really looks warm and dry. And but we still have kind of a warmer and drier signature to close out the month. Um, and then if we look at the uh, rest of the summer, kind of July, August, September, uh, this isn't quite as strong a, a warm and dry signature as we've seen previously from our Climate Prediction Center, but it's still uh, what I'd call a weak signature for warmer and drier than normal for, for that, that period. So um, fire season-wise, they really haven't made many updates here in Western Montana. They're not thinking uh, much in the way beyond normal conditions. And that's largely because of what Ray just said. You know, he mentioned uh, you know, not much in the way of drought conditions for the west of the divide. There's still some drought issues, maybe east of the east divide, but even those have, have, you know, been mitigated somewhat by the recent weather. Uh, but uh, basically they're going for normal conditions, I think, uh, in August for our part of the state, maybe a little bit above normal on either side of us. So we'll have to watch that. And then September, keeping it much the same way, so. That's the short and the uh, very long of it. Unless there are any questions, that's it from the weather. All right, thank you, Marty and Ray, appreciate it. Um, we'll move on to emergency alerts issued for the quarter. So using our RAVE emergency notification system, we sent, we issued a total of 16 emergency alerts that's um, six for missing persons and the resolutions there, that's really two incidents, one with a seven-year-old female and another with a 79-year-old male. Uh, there were two law enforcement incidents, activity incidents that we um, issued five alerts for, and there was one to the Tower Kerwald area for flooding potential early on. And then we had four test uh, alerts start using our normal IPAWS monthly testing system. That's what we had for the last quarter. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to recent IMT activation and mutual aid to Southwest Montana flooding. Ken Parks, is that you? Well, 
Well, hello, uh, Ken Parks, uh, Incident Commander for the Western Montana All Hazard Incident Management Team. Uh, we were called um, sometime in July, July 13th, I do believe, July 12th, we received a call to go to uh, Carbon County to assist them with a flash flooding event that uh, caused extensive damage throughout Carbon County, uh, Yellowstone County, and Park County. Um, we activated uh, with a full team. We were unable to find a plan section, so we uh, had to beg and borrow uh, plans people. But as we went out, um, some of our, our staffing was good. We got there at the right time. Uh, we were able to integrate closely with the Carbon County employees and form a good incident management team uh, and start addressing the issues they had there. Much of our focus was on resource management, um, public information, uh, some logistical work. Um, we did a lot with the visiting dignitaries. Uh, we had um, governors and electeds, uh, congressmen and senators coming down. Um, so that took a lot of our time. We did a lot of coordination with the state DES and with FEMA uh, between Carbon County and uh, helped them sort through a lot of that uh, confusing FEMA language um, and things of that, of that nature. Um, it was an unprecedented event, uh, 500 to 1,000 year flood that, uh, that caused extensive damage throughout Red Lodge uh, especially kind of went through the very downtown portion of Red Lodge and took out all the bridges and, communi and uh, communication sections. The power was out when we got there, but they got that up fairly quickly. Um, they did 84 air rescues through the National Guard while we were there. Um, 84 individuals that were trapped, um, cut off by the river. Um, out they were camping or their homes were cut off as the bridges were knocked out. So that was highly successful. Um, each section, you know, produced a, an executive summary. Um, we were able to, well, some of our successes was we were to bring out people who had not had exposure to incident management before. Um, we brought in some um, technical experts. A, a, we brought an engineer from Missoula County and a GIS person from Missoula City uh, who assisted uh, in a large way um, over there fixing things for those guys uh, and putting up stuff on the maps so that we were able to track it closely for, uh, for the FEMA reporting. Um, we stayed for some of us, you know, as, as it got slower, you know, the operations kind of slowed down as things started to move from that uh, response into recovery and some people, so we started to right size. Um, after a week or so, we started to let people go. And then by the end of the 14th day, there was just a few of us left um, as we uh, got everything put together for the transition to back to Carbon County to take over the incident. Uh, but it was highly successful. Uh, one of the other things that we were able to do was to activate the ESF, ESF4 uh, through FEMA and get federal employees to uh, become part of our team and help us through that. So that was new to us and uh, it proved to be uh, very helpful at the time as we were uh, missing some portions of our team we were able to fill in with uh, some of the federal people who were there. So that was a big success for us and a learning um, thing for us too because it was the first time we had really done that. That was it in a nutshell. Thank you, Ken, and uh, I believe uh, Nick has some information regarding the Livingston area. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, so while Ken was in Carbon County, Red Lodge, with our team, uh, I was in Livingston in Park County, uh, and I'm particularly pleased that Missoula County was able to support two out of the three heavily impacted counties, both Carbon and Park County. Um, I delayed, I was planning to go over to Carbon with the team, but uh, I was delayed because of a training that we were putting on. And in that time, we got a call from the Park County Emergency Manager asking for help. Uh, he, was, he was leaving uh, on the Saturday after um, the event started for a week-long, long-planned vacation. Um, duly deserved and so he needed some people to fill in in the emergency operations center and, and I went there and acted as the emergency operations center ma manager and we had when I got there the CAT team community assist team the other type 3 team in Montana was already on site performing damage assessments one of many damage assessments and they were there for a couple of days and then they left and the mission involved going forward involved three segments life safety um, critical infrastructure damage assessments and repair and 
recovery. So the sheriff's office largely took care of the life safety pieces. They did a lot of search and, search and rescue operations like they did in Carbon County. Uh, Public Works over there uh, took over critical infrastructure and started repairing very quickly roads and bridges. We, we got some bridges up that were, were down for a while. And then the OEM took over economic recovery and property damage. And we held some uh, flood resource events for folks uh, tailored to uh, the specific needs of communities. Um, there were three main communities in Park County impacted. Livingston was impacted by the flood itself, so there were a lot of muckouts and cleanups needed there. And uh, Gardner sits up high, so it wasn't necessarily so much flood impacted, though there were some big impacts from the flood, but it was more economically impacted. Uh, Gardner is a gateway into Yellowstone Park from the north end, and um, while Gardner was accessible, getting into Yellowstone was inaccessible. So that immediately took off well over half, probably around 80% of their economic activity. So a lot of what we did for them was just identify financial assistance and how they could move forward, put together a financial packet with all of the different assistance uh, modes that uh, we could identify so that they sort of had a, one piece of paper with, with everything they needed. And then there was also Cook City and Silvergate, which is way over on the southeast corner of Park County, and they were completely cut off from the rest of Park County. Not cut off from the world, they could still, um, you could still go through Cody, Wyoming, but it turned a, a two hour drive into a six hour drive. So um, we were dealing with uh, some lack of telephone services down there, uh, lack of um, other services, just had a hard time getting services down there, but we were able to, to support them um, and make sure that they felt supported and felt like they were getting what they needed. Uh, There's also a lot of debris management that we that we uh, worked on, and uh, and mail services were cut off from Cook City. Uh, they were not getting U.S. mail. They were not getting FedEx or UPS. Um, we were able to fix FedEx and UPS, but had not fixed FedEx by the time we left. You know, that's not a big deal when it comes to getting junk mail, but it is a big deal when it comes to getting mail order medications. So that was our primary focus there. That's sort of the gist of what we did in Park County. The timing was wor worked well for me to go over there because their emergency manager left on Saturday to go on that family vacation. I arrived on Thursday, so there was a little over that lap there, and then I stayed for 11 days. and stayed one day after he arrived back for, to uh, transition him back in and, and it worked out really really nicely a really neat mutual aid system and and i'm glad it worked out that way for for park county and for us thank you nick and ken uh excellent opportunity to help our neighboring counties um we'll move on to lepc standing committee reports slash updates and uh, imt oversight committee Well, I'm not a member of the Oversight Committee, but uh, I do can give you an update on the team. Um, we are getting ready for fire season. We've got some new equipment um, that we employed or deployed uh, into the Carbon County, and it worked out really well. Uh, we're looking at a few upgrades, um, potentially getting a Skylink and some radio stuff set up in our trailers. So uh, that was pretty nifty that we used it over there, and it worked really well for getting us uh, that sort of capability. Um, we're getting as many people into um, the IROC uh, National Wildfire System um, as quickly as we can to get ready for fire season. But I think that we should be ready here in a couple of weeks. Hey, we're having some interruptions uh, from the folks on Zoom. Uh, if you can mute your microphone, that would be appreciated. Um, other than that, uh, I think that we stand ready for fire season. We're probably looking at probably a later fall fire season, you know, as we uh, dry out and move into uh, into the fire season. So we're getting ready, though. End of report. Thank you, Ken. We'll move on to uh, Access and Functional Needs Committee, please. 
Uh, we had our AFN meeting last week, quarterly, uh, that precedes this one. I'll be leaving my position in September, so we had some discussions about future facilitation of those meetings going forward. Uh, we talked a little bit more about Smart 911, some updates that are being made on the back end to how we process uh, new registrations in the Smart 911 system and the forms we use and a little bit more continued discussion about the AFN grant funding that's going to be coming in to Summit ILC. And I think that's it. And a report. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, moving on to grants and plans. Uh, update to pre-disaster mitigation plan. So thank you. Missoula County is in the initial stages of updating its pre-disaster mitigation plan. This plan is needed in order to maintain eligibility for hazard mitigation grants um, and it helps identify what some of the projects for those grants would be. Um, the pre-disaster mitigation plan is slated for an update every five years, unfortunately or however, COVID has thrown the timeline off kilter. So. In order to stay eligible for these grants, Missoula County has, um, our, our last update, I should say, was in 2016. So we're due for that update. But in order to stay eligible in the meantime, we've submitted um, an, an application for um, extenuating circumstances to keep our, our grant current. So we will go forward with that in mind and uh, continue to seek hazard mitigation grants when, when appropriate. Okay, thank you. We'll uh, go to upcoming training and exercises with a recap and next steps of Missoula Family Reunification Training. Okay, here we are again. Uh, so Missoula County hosted a family reunification training uh, at uh, the Missoula County Fairgrounds in, in partnership with the Western Montana Healthcare Coalition. And this training was, was really well received and really well put on. Uh, we had it uh, put on by a group, I um, forget the name of them, I love you guys. And that group was founded out of an, a shooter incident that occurred uh, years ago and the, the, the parents of one of the victims started the I Love You Guys Foundation and now it's come to be known as one of the gold standards of family reunification after an active shooter and incident. And, and you know, these incidents are, are rare, but they're becoming more frequent. Uh, they happen, hopefully, not never in Missoula. You know, we hope that by training for it, that helps it helps our karma and that it won't happen here, but uh, it could. And so um, the next steps after the training are to continue to further develop and, and refine the things we learned within the training with the hopes that if Montana being a rural state like it is, the hopes are that we can have some quick deploying resource that can go to wherever the incident is. So we're not just talking about Missoula County now, we're talking about all of Western Montana and how we could have a team of uh, mental health professionals and law enforcement and community organizations active in disaster converge on an area at their request within two or three hours and really help to put that family reunification center together. Uh, it's a really tough thing to do for communities that have never done it before. So um, we are hoping that we will be able to support whoever needs it in their time of need. And it's a big deal. It really helps parents get through something, one of the toughest, if not the toughest times in their lives. So next steps, we'll be putting together some working groups and uh, continuing to define how we're going to go forward with that and build that capability out. Thank you, Nick. Do you have uh, information on item B, the Gallatin County Active Killer FSE? Not a lot. <laughs> Perfect. I do have a little, though. It is going to occur in mid-October. October. There will be some opportunity for folks from Missoula to participate. We don't know how limited or open that opportunity is yet, but we will certainly pass that down the line when we know. Um, so look for some active killer exercise uh, information coming in the future. 
All right. And a uh, small discussion of uh, local and statewide hazmat incidents since last meeting. Uh, we're not aware of any uh, statewide activations. Uh, none of those took place in the last quarter. But uh, a couple local incidents that affected uh, the immediate area with um, mostly hydrocarbon spills. Um, I believe uh, MFD Missoula Fire Department had a spill on Union Pacific with some diesel fuel from a saddle tank of a semi. Um, and uh, the Missoula Fire Department assisted Missoula Rural Fire District with a uh, fuel spill and uh, potentially some herbicide spill as a result of a pickup uh, that turned upside down in the uh, irrigation canal off of uh, Hiawatha and Mullen. So uh, that's two incidents that uh, happened locally. And we'll move on to uh, any roundtable or other discussions that uh, need to take place. If you uh, want to speak, we'll hand the mic to you. How about any of our uh, online folks? Uh, we don't have anybody in the room that's looking for the microphone, but uh, perhaps we have some in the online. One of the things I was going to bring up in the, for this meeting is that we are going to expand the facility here. So um, I thought we would be willing to put together a PowerPoint or some kind of a presentation for the community to uh, show what we're expanding. Them. Sounds good, Jeff. Do you want to be added to the agenda for uh, next quarter? Yes, please. We will do it. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? All right. Seeing none, we will uh, make that a wrap of our meeting for Tuesday, June 12th, 2022. Well, thank you.